Um, so we'd like now to move on to our third speaker this morning, um, who is Erica Peters, who's the Infectious Diseases and General Medicine Consultant in Glasgow, who's going to talk on HIV and injecting drug use, lessons learned from the Glasgow outbreak. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think we're, there's going to be a few themes coming through here, I can tell, you know, um, as the day goes on. So I guess I'm quite lucky in a way to be the third speaker here. Um, but there's obviously going to be overlaps with everything that we're talking about today. So I, th I think, from my point of view, um, I'm the clinical lead for the HIV outbreak, which you'll all be aware of, uh, which kind of really kind of came to light in about the beginning of 2015 in Glasgow, amongst our, uh, you know, homeless injecting population in Glasgow city centre very specifically at the time when it, when it first came to light. Um, and you know, my role um, as a back, in a, for a background is that I'm an infectious diseases and general medicine physician who work in the acute big hospital. But when we had the first sort of um, iterations of the hep C plans, um, I was employed um, to look at tr trying to deliver hepatitis C services, treatment services, in um, addiction services and in the prison. So we had a little bit of a background there. We were already delivering some of these services um, to difficult to reach populations, vulnerable populations, populations that I think most of you will be, be working with. Um, but we had taken our eye off the ball very much with HIV. So the focus was very much on hepatitis C. And um, I think it's, it's quite helpful for me to be asked to do this talk, to reflect back on things. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, we haven't got a huge amount of time, but just I, I'm reflecting myself personally because I've been um, a doctor for 30 years now. So I, I well, it shows my age, of course, I know I'm very old, but um, I'm looking at the, the, the group in the room here. There's a lot of you that are a lot younger than me as well. So you haven't sort of seen the HIV as it played out um, all the way through. So I want you to quickly kind of reflect on the sort of global and historical view on HIV because actually I think it tells us a lot about how we've approached this and the, the things that we have done wrong with the HIV outbreak in Glasgow. Um, so the two pictures on the screen here, some of you will remember this, I remember this from my teenage years, was the massive campaign, which was totally flawed now in retrospect. The, the terror about HIV, how terrible it was, you were going to get AIDS, there were tombstones, all this sort of stuff. And then the next picture I borrowed from Terence Higgins Trust, which is about the HIV elimination, which you've already heard about. And we have moved massively forward with HIV in terms of treatment, in terms of you know, the clinical outcomes for HIV, uh, and, also, and also in relation to stigma. But that is a huge part of what we're, you know, we all work with uh, for, at various levels, whether it's to do with drug use, sexuality, um, having certain infections or diseases. So I'm not going to dwell on this, but I think it is worth just thinking about the historical aspects of HIV. And, and you'll be aware that HIV um, first came to light in the early 80s as an unknown uh, pathology where uh, you know, gay men, an uh, extremely stigmatised group. And it's really interesting, you know, to look back and think, you know, in the early 80s, this group was really stigmatised. You know, we only had gay marriage in Scotland a few years ago, actually. Uh, but this group is not as stigmatised now. So I think there's real positives to be, you know, learned, uh, gained from, from looking back at this and looking at how, where we've come, admittedly, over a few decades now. Um, we obviously had the huge burden. The huge burden of HIV is still in Africa, uh, you know, in, a, in, in the low-income and, you, you could argue, probably an even more vulnerable uh, population level group. Um, and this, this is a, a picture of a haemophiliac boy, and this is in America. So this is a haemophiliac boy who's the same age as me, or was. He, he died of HIV um, you know, before, before he reached his 20s. But he was not allowed to go to school because he had HIV. You know, at the age of 15, his school wouldn't let him go to school. A middle-class, white American kid was really stigmatised. So this is a story about people on the fringes of society um, of smaller groups and people that have really struggled. And I think that's you know, still the case today, although the groups may have slightly changed. Um, it affected uh, you know, the black, Hispanic groups, so there's a racial element to this. Um, it, the Americans, until the relatively recent, banned anyone from HIV from travelling to the US. I don't know if you remember, if you've travelled to the US you know, in the years gone by, you had to fill out a disclaimer that specifically said, I do not have HIV. I mean, in incredible, really, if you think about it. And then there were glimmers of hope, and you know, people will know about it, you know, the, the um, Princess Diana touching somebody with HIV. It's like the, you know, the Bible and leprosy and all that sort of stuff. It really is kind of interesting to reflect on. And then from a clinical perspective, in uh, 1996, we had combination therapy. It was called cocktail therapy at the time. Massive numbers of drugs for people to take. 
Uh, but it did work, and this is from the um, Big AIDS meeting in uh, Canada in 1996. This was a huge change, a sea change, really, uh, but still extremely difficult. So I think it's still worth thinking about the, the big groups um, in the world, in the population, essentially low and middle income countries. But this has been a big focus uh, globally on terms of elimination. And a number of years ago, we had the 1990 strategy for HIV from WHO. And this is where we try to diagnose 90% of the population, put 90% of that population onto treatment, and have 90% of them on effective treatment, which we call undetectables, where your HIV virus is controlled on drugs. And we know that that equates to good clinical outcomes and actually, if you get your HIV diagnosed early, your mortality compared to somebody without HIV is, is um, as good. A, and if not, actually, in some cohort studies, actually you've shown that if you have HIV, you do better than someone that doesn't. And you think, well, oh, that's a bit weird. Why is that? Well, that is because you come and see people like me that say, do you want to stop that smoking? That'd be really good for you. And I'll just check your blood pressure, and I'll put you on a blood pressure pill. And, oh, you've got a bit of a cough. Well, maybe get a chest x-ray and get that sorted out. And if you, you lose a few pounds, that would help you too. So because we have a you know, holistic approach, look at them in a medical way, probably if you've got HIV, because you're regularly seeing somebody that's looking at your whole health, your mental health, your addiction health, all that sort of stuff, you actually can do better with HIV, which, which is uh, you know, really a, a sort of good news message. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I, I put this slide in just because I am not a data person and I am not an academic and I'm not a policy person. But the one thing, well, one of many things I've learned from doing this outbreak is you need to have good data because we can't go to people like Nicola without good data to say actually what we're doing works and helps. So it's pretty dull in some respects, and it's often not on your priority list when someone comes to you and says, oh, can you tell me how many people are doing this and how many people are doing that and what are your lists of figures for this and that? But actually, it's really, really important. And this, this is the data, of, um, global data from Fast Track about whether, when they do the modeling, if they put a lot of money in at the beginning and work really hard and have really ambitious targets globally, if it will make a difference to the HIV outcomes. And the answer is, yes, it will, you know, if we don't do anything, um, we're going to end up with more cases and more problems. Um, and that is true locally and, again, at a very sort of small level. And then we already heard about COVID. We all know about COVID. And this um, came out uh, the year before last. This is WHO response. And I just, you know, I think the wording of it is kind of quite helpful, unequal, unprepared, under threat. And this was talking about elimination targets and talking about the vulnerable groups of patients that we, um, you know, that we were working with um, on a global level might be, might be slightly different groups, but still affecting infectious diseases. And we know from COVID outcomes that people that did worse with COVID were in more vulnerable groups. Poverty was a significant issue with COVID. And it's no different for any other infectious diseases you know, that I work with when you look at, at, at bigger numbers, um, as well as at an individual level. So HIV in the UK, where are we at uh, today? It is still an infection largely of the MSM population um, and we still need to focus very much on that. So I think um, although we're talking about drugs today and from my point of view, the HIV outbreak has been labelled as an injecting drug use outbreak, it's very much part of uh, sexual health and we really need to remember these people are still sexually active and we can't forget about that. And we have MSMs throughout our population. They're not just sitting in one little group there. There'll be MSMs that inject drugs, that use drugs, or are involved in your services as well. So we must focus on, on these groups as well. The, the next biggest group is heterosexual population. They do actually get kind of missed out a wee bit in HIV, because uh, I think people don't think of them as being a, a sort of a risk group necessarily. Um, but in the UK, we've done quite well with our 1990 90 targets. But as John was talking about hep C, same with HIV, there's still an undiagnosed population or a population that doesn't engage in care. And this is across the board. This isn't just thinking about outbreak uh, numbers. And we, we need to think about uh, trying to target that population, you know, in whichever sort of line of work that you're, you're in, in in healthcare. This is slightly old, this data, but in the UK context, it's just making the point that in the, and these are the sort of uh, transmission risk groups um, broken down here with um, the MSM being the, the biggest group, the green bars going down to heterosexual um, men and women, and then the little yellow group is injecting drug users. So it's not a huge problem numerically in injecting drug users. 
But if you look at when they're diagnosed, are they diagnosed late? So that's the, the, the darker colours. You can see that MSMs, because you know, in, in general terms, we have good sexual health services for MSMs and they'll get more testing done in general, they tend not to be diagnosed as late, but the other populations can be diagnosed later. And that, that counts in HIV. So when you're diagnosed very late with HIV, uh, then your outcomes are not as good. So it's really important to get testing done early because we can make a difference. So this is just taking us back down to more sort of local level. And this is our total cohort in Glasgow. So we, we have about 2,000 patients that attend our service at Brownlee Centre. Very much a hospital-based service originally. Um, th that was for good reason because we have a very holistic approach, pr approach and, you know, back in the... 90s when the service was in Ruck Hill and then moved to Gartnaval, there was a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, for example, things like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, mental health, and having all the team in one place, a sort of one-stop shop, made a lot of sense and worked really, really well. Um, and that, that was the kind of model that we were starting with in 2015. We didn't really have any HIV service outside um, of the hospital. So you had to turn up you know, with a proper appointment time pitch up and, and see whoever you're going to see there. Um, and our population reflects very much the population of um, um, the rest of the UK, so majority MSM, heterosexual, and a relatively small number of people who inject drugs as their transmission risk. Um, and our outcomes are very good. Um, um, we have w way over 90% of our patients you know, on, on treatment and undetectable. What I want to just uh, point to you out is that this is our uh, age curve and I know you can't probably read it but essentially about half our patients are over 50 and some of them are in their 80s so I just want to just kind of if you're not familiar with HIV this is a disease of older adults now of an aging population um, and also just to remind everybody that people over 50 still have sex they can still pick up infectious diseases it seems slightly, slightly odd and people may be in their 60s and 70s they might not have had sex yesterday, but they possibly had it 10 years ago. So, <laughs> so I'm in my 50s, I have to kind of make that point now. But, um, but it's just, it's quite interesting, you know, to think about the demographics. So of course, we must focus on younger people, um, but a lot of the people in the outbreak, are, you know, our, our average age of diagnosis is about 39. Um, so a lot of them are older, and we have patients from the outbreak who are still inject, actively injecting that are in their 60s. So we need to think about that, that age group and also the different kind of um, comorbidities that they may, they may have. Um, so HIV treatment, as I mentioned to you, is uh, much better. We started off with like literally handfuls of tablets that patients had to take uh, two or three times a day. Sometimes, depending on their medication, they might have to drink three litres of water with some of that medicine. But this is one of a couple of studies that came out um, oh, about seven years ago now, showing that with HIV treatment, if you start it early, essentially when you're diagnosed, um, it improves all-cause mortality and morbidity. And so for every single person that's diagnosed with HIV, we want to start them on treatment. It doesn't need to be the same day, but as soon as would be good because that helps you um, in, in the medium and long term. And so everyone should be on treatment. And the treatment is really easy nowadays. And so John talked about hepatitis C treatment, you know, an eight-week course. And of course, hep C, you can cure. HIV, we cannot cure, but we can certainly treat it. And most of our patients are on one pill or two pills once a day, no side effects at all, really straightforward and easy to take. And one of the things we've done with the outbreak is um, when, and, and slightly, we're looking at this just now, but it was easier when people were on daily methadone, which obviously the trend has moved away from that for, for very good reasons. Um, so a lot of patients on Buvidal and things like that. But we have got a community pharmacy project in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So patients can get their antivirals dispensed from the pharmacy that they get their ORT from. And that's been really um, helpful and effective. And we've evaluated it in other ways, and I think that's been a good thing. Um, so my, my role really is to look after an individual with HIV and look after their individual health and improve their morbidity and their, uh, their mortality. But in terms of the outbreak, one of the, the key, and there's, there's many different um, um, aspects from a public health point of view, but one of the key ones is this, this term of treatment as prevention or TASP. So by treating an individual, that will reduce the amount of virus they have and reduce the chance of them transmitting it onto somebody else. Now we know sexually that that works, there's excellent data on that. So if you have HIV 
and your viral load is undetectable, and whether you're heterosexual, whether you're, it's gay sex, we know that you cannot transmit HIV on that way. And that's fantastic for people um, you know, in, in terms of their, their kind of overall sexual well-being. You know, this, is, this is an infection that affects people that love each other most of the time, and it's quite a difficult kind of concept for, for patients to, to struggle with and their partners to struggle with. Um, so U equals U um, is fantastic, but it does, just to point out, it does only apply, the data is only there for sexual transmission, so we don't have the data for injecting drug use. One of the things that we can say is we can extrapolate a lot of this from things like needle stick injuries. So we've done a lot of work in the past on people that get a needle stick injury, you know, usually healthcare workers from working with someone with HIV. And we know that if their viral level is low, I mean, it's simple science, you don't need to be a, a, a medic to understand this. Simple science, uh, if your viral load is really low, the chance of you passing it on, whether it's through an injection, through sex or whatever, is really low. So TASP is really important. PrEP I'm not going to talk about because you're going to hear a bit about that uh, later on, I think. Uh, but that's, that's another really important thing. So that's, that's when we give HIV treatment before you get infected to prevent you getting infected to high-risk people. Now, um, this doesn't come out very well, but... HIV in an injecting drug use population is not new, um, and Edinburgh, you know, we were world leaders in this in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and there's some really, and it, there's a really nice documentary, I think, in the BBC did a few years ago about um, the HIV outbreak in uh, Edinburgh with, with some of the patients and some of the staff that worked in that, the police and things, so it was really interesting, and obviously train spotting and things, and, um, and so that, that, we should have learned a lot about that, so that really kind of um, was you know, the first thinking about harm reduction, about needle exchange, all that sort of stuff. And as we say, we think we, we kind of have taken our eye off the ball a little bit with that. Despite having really good harm reduction, needle exchange compared to other parts of the world, we still got an outbreak. And although I've shown that that was a historical slide, in relatively recent history, there's been outbreaks in, in um, you know, in Dublin, um, in Athens, and then we've kind of, we know about the opi opiate issues in states where there's been HIV outbreaks there. And these have been in places where the needle exchanges have fallen apart, where there hasn't been good addiction care. Um, and so it was something that, that Glasgow kind of, I think, were a bit complacent over, actually, because we, we had all that. It shouldn't have happened here. And then the history, as you know, is in 2014, we had this funny strain of HIV. Our virus lab picked it up. Um, and said, look, there's something funny going on here. We're seeing quite a few new cases with this funny strain of HIV. Um, and um, in 20, the early 2015, uh, public health um, started to look into this. Um, and so this was the initial sort of stuff. There was this, this odd resistance pattern. So every time someone gets an HIV, new diagnosis done, we look at resistance. So that's um, a, a lab test that we do to make sure we can give them the right kind of medicine. And this was a funny, a funny looking thing. And what that resistance pattern meant was that this is the HIV virus um, and there's different bits of the virus. Now, now with COVID, you all know this, right? Because it's been on the telly all the time. All these uh, presentations that have been on the TV about COVID, it's great, actually. I love it um, because people know about these things now. So the virus comes in, makes baby viruses, pops out and infects lots of other cells and damages these immune cells as it does all this. And there's various different parts of that pathway that the drugs can target. But with this particular resistance strain, we've knocked out one uh, group, quite a significant group of those meds. So we had to be quite careful with what we were doing with this group of patients because resistance is an issue in HIV and it's really something that we had to really focus on. I'm not going to say any more about that, but, but you know, this, this was a vulnerable group of people with vulnerable um, situations um, with a, a slightly more difficult virus to treat. And we, we mentioned, Nicola very briefly mentioned the Nessie study, um, but that, this is a study, if you don't know about this, that was uh, set up for hep C purposes, really, to look at hep C prevalence in Scotland, and HIV was added into that, where the needle exchange, it, it, the patients that attend a needle exchange um, are interviewed um, about their drug use and their bloodborne virus history, and then they get a, an anonymous test done, and then that's anonymously linked back. And this gives us an idea of the prevalence of hepatitis C um, throughout Scotland. Um, and this is the one. For, this is us for Glasgow. And so we were thinking that the prevalence in injecting drug users was about one percent um, until 2015, when it jumped up. And we're waiting for the uh, Nessie study, which only just started post-COVID again now. So we'll wait for that. It's uh, Andy McCauley and colleagues that do that. It'll be really interesting to see where we're at with that um, going forward. So we're now up about 10% uh, 
in our last study, which is a couple of years out of date now. So that is significant. I'm just going to jump through that. So this, this is showing the actual numbers of patients that we have in our current outbreak. And we had a big peak in um, 2015 because we did a lot of work. Um, we tested a lot more people. Um, and so those people that were probably sitting with HIV for maybe a, maybe a, a year or more, um, we, we diagnosed them. So, so the numbers jumped up. But then we had a number of new cases, and we can, we can tell from the virus whether it's relatively new in the last three months or so, or it's an older virus. So we can tell quite a lot about things from the lab. Um, and then, as you can see, it's plateaued off. And we've only had possibly two cases, probably more like one case, in the last year. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we have succeeded, it's gone, we've done our job? Probably not. It probably means we haven't tested people because of COVID, okay? Um, and I said at the beginning, and this was a, a, a problem of Glasgow City, and it was, but we do have cases now out in the west in, in sort of the, the Renfrewshire and Verclyde area. So we need to be really careful of this. There's been a couple of cases in Lanarkshire, and Lanarkshire have been looking really closely at this as well. This does affect, as you know, uh, the homeless population significantly more, and we have a significant female population here, you know, particularly vulnerable, I'd say. So we've really focused very much on, um, on that group um, with, with my sexual health colleagues. Um, and again, this data is slightly out of date, but, but it has been looked at a lot. So the cocaine use was the issue, probably, because um, people are injecting multiple times a day, so that increases your risk. Homelessness, a definite risk factor. Frequent incarceration, and I think, I think that, that goes without saying that was, wasn't a surprise to us. And, and the increased risk of public injection were the key factors when this was looked at um, with my academic colleagues. And so a typical patient will be um, moving between lots of um, unscheduled care appointments, which my colleagues in ED are dealing with all the time, particularly in the Royal, um, injecting related complications, overdoses, in and out of prison, quite difficult to get hold of in various different accommodations. As you know, they, they're a very uh, fluid population in terms of their accommodation, in terms of their pharmacy. So this isn't a group of patients that are going to turn up like some of my other patients twice a year for a quick check at the hospital or a telephone discussion with me or maybe see the nurse. So quite a tricky population. And as, as you know, um, you know, we very much lots of comorbidities physically, but also a lot of trauma there, as, as, as you know. Um, and particularly, I think, which I maybe didn't quite appreciate from my other work that I'd done, um, you know, a lot of actual, you know, emotional and physical trauma in childhood, but also sexual trauma as well. So like an awful lot of um, challenges that had never really been addressed because of the kind of difficulties that they had and, and the insecurities of their situations. Um, so what did we do? Well, one of the things we maybe didn't quite learn to do quickly enough was to do things really fast. And the Athens outbreak had sort of taught us that. They published like slightly after our outbreak was identified and they were very quick, but their needle exchanges and things had fallen apart a bit. So they worked really hard on trying to get all that stuff up and running. So I think we could have been quicker actually with what we had to do. And it's really hard to advocate um, for this group. Um, and even back, you know, pre-COVID money was tight. It wasn't easy to get support and funding for this. And it does need support and funding. Um, and also, I think the fact that it's very, it's, it's NHS, but it's multi-agency. So it's multi-agencies within the NHS, within our board area, within different directorates within the board. Um, you know, I work in acute medicine. That is my directorate. So these ambulances you see queuing up outside the front door are what my managers are interested in. They're not so interested in me saying to them, actually, I need a wee help with getting a wee nurse out in, out in the homeless addiction centre. That would be quite nice. Thanks very much. So these are the, these are the challenges. But we want to move from this. It's a nice statue around the corner here of you know the, um, the people sleeping rough and and um, you know this sort of Jesus uh, statue thing, round to people living to happy old age. You know that they're they're holistically looked after and cared for. Um, so that's just what, what kind of the bits that I was involved in. Um, so you're going to hear a bit about um, all the different aspects of public health, the PrEP, um, IEP, um, you, know, you guys know about um, opiate replacement therapy and all that sort of stuff. And these things are really important. And when they've looked at this and the sort of cost 
economic anal analysis in the states and things, they do show that having really good um, opiate replacement therapy services, addiction services, IEP and treatment as prevention need to be supported financially for, um, for HIV outbreaks to work. We haven't done the health economic analysis, but I mean, I think it's pretty clear that that's what you need to do. Um, and these were just like the, the sort of timelines, if you like, of the things that we did do and how long it took us to do things. Um, so it took a while. We, we very much knew that we had to take this service to the patients, that they weren't going to come. But actually to implement that is quite difficult, actually, in the, in the current climate, um, even more difficult. So we've had to fight all the way along to keep our nursing staff that we have doing um, services in um, Hunter Street, which is the homeless addiction service, as was uh, in 2015. Um, so we have a clinic there, and it's supported by myself and one of my other colleagues as well, so they, we, can, we can see patients in the clinic. We do occasionally, and I even personally occasionally do home visits or go out to hostels, but our nurses do a lot of outreach literally on the streets, working very closely, particularly with Waverly Care and the Simon community, um, and, and kind of helping patients and literally seeing them, you know, if they're out begging and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we very much moved to trying to take the treatment and the care to the patients. And our nurses, although you know, they're trying to primarily look after their physical health, are very much involved in trying to signpost people, you know, phone up, try and get people registered with a GP. So a lot of that work is stuff that's really difficult to measure. And our health board managers don't really understand that. That is the really um, challenge of this, this uh, job, to say that actually to meet health inequalities, you need to change the service. You need to have a service that supports the same outcomes. But to do that is uh, costly in terms of staffing because it's really time consuming, as you, you guys all know. And this is our data. So we have uh, pulled together the data, um, and, and you know, we, had, we had to get an academic day to do, do this. And my colleague, Becky Metcalf, who's one of my sexual health colleagues, uh, had some academic time to try and look at this. And this first uh, graph shows the time taken to start people on treatment. And now we start people on treatment pretty much the same day as we tell them their diagnosis, if we can, uh, which, is, which is most of the time. And also, uh, this, remember the 1990 target. So we managed to get about 86% when we looked at this in 2019 of our patients uh, with an undetectable viral load and on treatment. And that is no mean feat. But this shows that it can be done right. So it's not a question of writing this population off, which could so easily have been done. Um, mortality is really high, but people do not die of HIV, okay, so uh, our mortality in this rate, because I think these are the extremely vulnerable population, um, is largely drug deaths. Now, I haven't got the up-to-date figures because it takes time to look at this, but when we looked at it before, and Becky looked at it before, this, this is related to trauma and drug death. It's not related to their HIV, so, you know, we, we do need to think about that. COVID has a massive impact on testing, as you know, and this is a real concern of mine and hopefully a concern of yours, because if we don't know who's got HIV or Hep C, I've got a Hep C hat as well, uh, we, we're not going to be able to treat them. Um, and our local data from last year showed that only 36% of our patients that were attending addiction services had had a bloodborne virus test in the last 12 months, which is way down. It wasn't great to start with, but it's a way down. So haven't seen this year's data. It will be better, uh, but it's a real, real um, focus that we all need to be involved in. So currently, out of having 190 patients, we've got 116 in active care. Some of them have died, unfortunately. Some of them have moved elsewhere. Um, but there was only 10 of that 116 when I checked last week that had had a detectable viral load. So that's, that's pretty good. So we're doing well with treatment. So it can be done. Um, and about 54% of them are on this community prescribed um, pathway that we have, which works well for a lot of people. And we're, we're, as, as people have moved on to Buvidal, we're kind of looking at that. But um, uh, my initial reaction for Buvidal, from my own personal point of view, from an HIV point of view, was this is going to be a disaster for our patients because if they're not coming in to get their treatment daily, it's going to be a nightmare. I, I haven't looked at the data properly yet. We're looking at it just now, as I say. But actually, I think the patients that are on Buvidal are doing so much better. My feeling is actually because they're holistically generally better, they're actually fine at taking their tablets every day. So, but we need to keep our eye on the ball with all of that. So the key learning points, and these are my own personal uh, points, <coughs> points where advocacy is so important and you know it's really it's really hard work and you guys all know this but it, it, is, it, it is worthwhile and it, it does make a difference data which isn't my bag is really important and without data we can't get policy and without policy we can't get funding and we can't get things to work um, I, th I do 
it get upset about the lip service to health inequalities that we see in NHS and all that sort of thing. So I think we need to call that out when we see that. There's discrimination at every level, including with some of my colleagues. And um, we still see that. The stigma is much less, certainly with the MSM, with other, um, maybe with, hopefully with trans, a little bit less. But we still see stigma with the injecting drug use population in the hospi at the hospital level, certainly. So I'm hoping that when I give this talk in 10 years' time, when I'm retired, <laughs> then I won't be talking about the stigma related to drug use, which is still a real thing. Uh, needs to be joint approach. You all know that partnership working so important, but difficult. Um, have a go, try something new. I think it's important to do that. We've worked really well with different groups and tried things. Some of it hasn't worked, some of it's worked brilliantly, um, but you, you should, shouldn't be scared to change and try. Um, and um, testing, a real issue just now, we absolutely have to do it. We absolutely have to do it after elimination for hepatitis C. It's even more important at that point. And certainly going forward with HIV is going to be really important because we need to uh, keep making sure there's not an out another outbreak on its way. Thank you.